Coming up on Market to Market. The fossil fuel industry receives a lump of coal in its stocking. Aging River Infrastructure receives a gift card for a makeover. And the Christmas flower gives a business lesson. Those stories and market analysis with Angie Setzer next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, December 23 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. As the Perry Como song goes, there's no place like home for the holidays. And while new home sales have fallen off, more people moved around the country last month than any time over the past decade. National Association of Realtors data shows sales of existing homes rose seven-tenths of a percent last month, the highest since 2007. And while manufacturing plants have begun to restock, the Commerce Department says orders for durable goods fell four-tenths of a percent in November on declining aircraft sales. Without the shiny silver birds, the rate rose half a percent. And investment in the economy continued its record-breaking run as Wall Street rang the bell midweek within 30 points of the mythical 20,000-point threshold, only to fall back slightly by the final session. As the market continues its climb to unprecedented levels, there is a palpable anticipation for the opening of the energy exploration floodgates. However, the 44th president is enacting policies some have referred to as tax in the road, hindering the 45th president from keeping his promise of unleashing the nation's energy reserves that are currently out of reach. Josh Bittner has the details. Continuing a slew of environmental regulatory moves in its waning days, the Obama administration added further steps this week to safeguard against unintended side effects of fossil fuel excavation. A buffer zone blocking coal mining operations from within 100 feet of waterways was declared with the goal of protecting 6,000 miles of streams and 52,000 acres of forests from contamination by unearthed debris. The rule also would require companies to restore affected streams and land areas to conditions similar to those present before mining took place, including replanting native trees and vegetation. Mining industry advocates and coal state politicians on both sides of the aisle denounce the measures as job killers. But Interior Department officials claim fewer than 300 jobs would be lost when the update to early 1980s requirements takes effect next month. North Dakota's Attorney General took steps to block implementation in the Peace Garden State, calling the effort the epitome of a midnight regulation. A majority vote in Congress could reject the guidelines nationwide and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said he will use every tool available towards such an effort. Last week, federal agencies also denied a Minnesota mining company's request to renew a mineral lease near the state's Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, triggering a review process which could bar all new mining activities in the region for 20 years. The area sits atop potentially lucrative untapped deposits of copper, nickel, and other valuable elements. Canadians know that strong action on the environment is good for the economy. In conjunction with Canada's prime minister, the president rounded out his environmental push this week by declaring the bulk of U.S.-owned waters in the Arctic and certain areas of the Atlantic Ocean indefinitely off-limits to future oil and gas leasing. However, the American Petroleum Institute, 
A trade association representing the nation's oil and natural gas producers argued there is no such thing as a permanent ban, citing President George W. Bush's 2008 use of a simple memorandum to overturn any restrictions. Existing leases are not affected by the president's executive actions. But White House officials remain confident that by employing an arcane provision of 1950s era law, Obama's statute provides no authority for subsequent presidents to undo his final orders. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Mammoth loads of grain travel from inland river bases to outbound ports of call along arteries tamed by equipment that in some cases is eight decades old. The federal agency tasked with keeping river traffic moving has appeared at the door of Congress, hat in hand, on more than one occasion. Recently, enough congressional members agreed the aging gear was due for a much-needed makeover. John Torpy has the story. The Army Corps of Engineers made the nice list in Congress with a recently passed bill that helps address the issues facing the nation's inland waterways. Included in the recently passed stopgap spending measure to keep the doors on Capitol Hill open for business until April of 2017, Congress also passed the Water Resources Development Act. The legislation provides $10 billion for repairs and improvements to the dilapidated lock and dam system. 30 new projects, along with eight existing ones, were given the green light based on a wish list provided to Congress by the Army Corps of Engineers. The projects include addressing a myriad of issues plaguing the aging infrastructure along the Mississippi River and other inland waterways. The act also provides resources for flood risk management and ecosystem infrastructure restoration projects. The recently signed and released Water Resources Development Act had some encouraging indications from the perspective of many within the Rock Island District of the Army Corps of Engineers. There is language within the bill that relates to several projects within our district's purview. Although WERDA doesn't appropriate the funding by which work is carried out, the bill does set the groundwork for providing authorizations. These authorizations are the first critical step in the process that brings projects to fruition. While the Corps is happy their concerns are being heard, officials in the upper Mississippi River Basin were hoping the bill would have included funds to get specific projects in their region underway. Market to Market will have an in-depth report on rural America's lifeline for agricultural trade in the coming months. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. According to the National Christmas Tree Association, 25 million fresh-cut trees with a price tag of more than a billion dollars were sold in 2015. A good share of those trees were sold to families in search of the perfect tannenbaum. But holiday horticulture comprises more than just the venerable tree. Plants and flowers of various types also are responsible for proclaiming the season. Just getting those trimmings to market involves more than meets the eye. And in one case, teachers are using the lesson of hard work as an academic pilgrimage. Paul Yeager explains. The Christmas tree gets the lights and songs, but not everyone cuts down a live one and puts that in their home. The one embracing the colors of Christmas is the Mexican transplant, the poinsettia. Brilliant bracts of green and red, white or pink. The plant has more than 100 variations. Blooms naturally around Christmas time, which made it a good, good fit for uh, the holidays. So it blooms based on day length, so we don't have to man- manipulate it too much to get it to flower. But it's also kind of the traditional Christmas colors. Those colors have evolved as the plant has grown in popularity. More than 30 million are sold each year, according to USDA, almost one-fourth of all flowering potted plants purchased to rack up more than $144 million in sales. The poinsettia first came to the United States in 1825, but only set roots in our lexicon during the 1960s. The lobster flower, or flame leaf flower as it's also called, is found almost anywhere from churches to homes. 
New varieties emerge every year as hybrids take hold, and science works most of the time. There'll be a slight difference. So maybe the bract color is darker, or uh, you'll have a, a thousand white plants and one is pink. So a lot of them are just natural mutations where we did some cross-pollinating to get one variety and then it's just naturally mutated. That's very common in plants. Randall Voss is the horticulture program chair at Des Moines Area Community College in Ankeny, Iowa. Annually, he leads a class that grows the poinsettia from sprig to sale. Our main goal with the poinsettias is, is to give the students a hands-on class. They don't have tests in this class. It's all how do your plants turn out. The customers are usually faculty or staff on campus. Voss, who has a background in commercial horticulture, helps students understand the demands of the end user, extending the lesson as growing the best plant root to bract. If we test the pH of the media, the salt content of the media, which lets us know if we're fertilizing too much or not. Every week they have to graph the height of the poinsettias because we have to follow a growth curve to see if we're um, in line with the height. Uh, and some of these varieties, uh, we did not you know, stay on top of the heights. They're too tall, and, and that's part of the grading requirement. Macklin Briggs is one of those students getting his hands dirty in class. He says timing is key as the poinsettia performs better in drier conditions to help the modified leaves form fully. Well, there's a science to growing all plants, but with these, yeah, you want to get spacing right so they grow the right height and so they don't get weak stem and all the brackets are fully formed. And that knowledge Briggs plans to use in his horticulture career. Whatever you learn from growing a poinsettia, you're able to take that and then apply it to other plants. A couple of notes about the poinsettia. The leaves are not poisonous individually. You would need to consume more than 500 leaves to have any harmful effect, according to a study from Ohio State University. The same study reveals pets dining on a milky leaf could experience nausea or intestinal irritation. California is the nation's top poinsettia producing state in the U.S. September's shorter sunlit days signal to the poinsettia it is time to change colors or bloom. The internal clock interprets more dark than daylight as the cue to initiate the flower. Greenhouses take precautions to block out any light as to not disturb the cycle. The window for error is small and can be delicate, even for seasoned professionals. The tricky thing about poinsettia is you get one chance every year. There's only one poinsettia crop. So even if a grower has been working for 10 years in a greenhouse, they've only grown 10 poinsettia crops. Most other greenhouse crops are growing them year round. So let's say in the spring, you might get five shots at growing petunias. And Voss's hands-on approach stresses the customer's expectation, uniformity. The customer doesn't know that this plant naturally grows taller, that one naturally grows shorter. It's up to the grower to make everything uniform. So you look down the bench, no matter what variety there is, they're all the exact same height, because that's what the customer wants. They might put two of these plants together, they want them the same height, and uh, that's kind of what makes or breaks you. I mean. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. South American weather once again worked at cross pur pur purposes with healthy exports and left the grain markets lower just before the holiday. For the week, March wheat fell 16 cents and the nearby corn contract dropped 11 cents. News of a record crop in Brazil and more good weather in Argentina continued to hold the soybean complex at bay as the March contract finished 49 cents lower. March meal was carried along by the news and lost $9.80 per ton. In the softs, March cotton shook off $1.17 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, January Class Three milk futures declined 31 cents. The livestock sector finished mixed as the February cattle contract put on 95 cents. March feeders added 40 cents, and the February lean hog contract shed $1.50. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index climbed eight basis points. Crude oil gained seven cents per barrel. 
Gold fell for the eighth week, losing $3.80 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index declined just over two points to finish the week at 391.30. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Angie Setzer. Angie, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, you can listen to our market discussion anytime by downloading our market analysis podcast on our website, iptv.org m2m. Now, as we get started, Angie yeah. Setzer, let's talk about this wheat market. Mm -hmm. We broke down below $4 here in the Chicago. Does this set us up for continued downward movement? A lot of times they'll tell you in a bearish market that you tend to see the next market in line trade down to where the first market at one point traded. Um, in the December side of things, it really got ugly. I think it, at one point we were in the 360 range in Chicago. I don't know. I kind of blacked out there. It was it was it was nasty. Um, and I, so I think we're seeing a little bit of that right now. The the market's still focused on the Australian crop. Um, there's discussion there that the the Australian crop. The USDA came out and, and put it at 33 million metric ton, which is phenomenal. I mean, it's huge for Australia. Um, and now there's talk lying there that they could see another 2 million metric ton added. So 75 to, to 80 million bushel or so on an already giant crop. Um, talk is that Argentina also increased their acreage. So right now there's there, the conversation continues to be centered around the fact that the dollar hit 15 year highs and that production in areas that don't traditionally or in, in the areas that we need to stumble first are not stumbling. Um, so the path of least resistance at this point seems to be lower. Uh, there's a lot of stories going forward that we should see pick up in wheat, um, poor quality going into to dormancy, that cold weather effect. There's talk that we could see another really cold snap here, another two to, to three weeks out in the Southern Plains, um, that wheat's uncovered at you this bet. point. No snow. Um, no snow, so that could be major. Um, but at this point in time, the dollar and, and big crops getting bigger in, in foreign countries are, are really weighing heavy on the market. Are we continuing to see the large speculators add to their short positions? Are they continuing to be active sellers? Yeah, they're just, I mean, it's, if it's a day that ends in Y, it's a day that funds seem to be selling wheat, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, we did get a bounce off from the really cold weather that we saw here last week, um, but with that not getting any legs underneath it, you know, it, it, going into the holiday, the continued strength in the dollar again, yeah. um, you know, we just weren't able to, to pick up the ball and run with it from there. All right. Into the corn market, yeah. down following uh, following wheat or following mm -hmm. beans, perhaps to the downside. Corn dropped ten cents in the nearby. What do you do? Well, with corn, um, you know, it's it's like last year all over again, except for maybe we're. 10, 20 cents lower than where we were trading last year at this time in that range anyway. Uh, it seems to be corn likes to run between about 343, uh, 363. Uh, we tested the last rally that we had. We tested that 363 range on the March. We failed to close above 362, which is what I was hoping we would see um, happen. You know, not because I'm a, a huge tech trader. I'm, I'm more of your backyard tech trader where the numbers that mattered before continue to matter. Um, the fact that we didn't trade above that and, and tried to hit that 375 or so kind of told me that we would see it trade lower again. And we'll test the, the lower side, the, the 340, the lower 340 range, which we are right yeah. now. Um, of course, with wheat not being able to get legs underneath it, um, corn has a hard time rallying because with a lot of wheat out there, if, if corn tries to separate itself too far from wheat, people are going to discuss wheat feedings. I don't necessarily think that you're going to see a significant amount of wheat come out of storage to go into feed just because now that it's it's put away it's not really something that people are going to dig out all that off you know to to feed but it's still a story that you're going to hear okay um so i think corn's being weighed down that and it rained in argentina and right now, to me, everyone was focusing on Argentinian rains for soybeans when the reality was Argentina is in the middle of their, or getting into their more crucial weather pattern um, or their more crucial period for production. Um, so they got the rain that they needed, and, and here we sit. All right. We've got a question here from one of our followers on uh, Twitter. This is from Kenny in Neely, Nebraska at, at Rainicky Farms. He's asking, is it worth the risk to wait and see how the acreage battle plays out to price uh, in March to price new crop corn? 
I think when you see new crop corn get up into the range that we saw last year, we started last year with for a lot of guys in that 385 to 390 range, um, depending if they had on-farm storage or not. That was a higher level of futures. We did see the market rally from there on a weather scare. I think we will, um, but most of the guys that I'm working with right now, we are looking to start locking in some futures in that 390 range, doing futures only at this point in time. We're not necessarily locking in cash um, just because we have the intent of rolling it out later, hopefully adding some carry, um, you know, because hopefully we'll see a, a weather rally and we'll be able to, to trade our harvest movement at a higher level. Okay. But to get started, I mean, none of my guys this year right now are sad that we contracted 390 futures right. a year ago. Um, and I think we're, we're setting ourselves up without a, a weather issue to really trade the same ranges that we've been trading the last couple right. years. Soybeans down hard on yeah. the week. 50 cents broke through $10. Just global supplies, again, is the concern? Well, yeah. I mean, right now, the Brazilian crop looks good. Argentina looks good. Now that they've gotten rain, um, there's maybe 10 to 15% of the Brazil area that has some dryness concern to it, but not really anything that you would want to write home about. Argentina seeing the rain again, not anything you want to write home about on, on concerns now. They'll be able to finish planting the crop. And, and from the sounds of it, it looks pretty good down there. Now, granted, we have to get the crop in the bin. Right. But it's still, even if we were to take 2 million metric ton off the Brazil crop and a couple million metric ton off the Argentina crop estimates that we're seeing right now, we're not looking at a loss similar to what we had a year ago. Right. Um, and so I think going into this month, traders had last year in mind and, and were willing to put a risk premium in place much greater than what they were a year ago. Last year, there was no, it wasn't yeah. on anyone's radar that we would see a production more loss. More 850 through the entire exactly. week. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then we were going to sell for seven at harvest and yep. then Brazil and, and Argentina surprised us and, and we traded much higher from there um, for good reason. This year, though, I think that we put the risk premium in before we got there um, because traders, of course, have very short memories. Right. Remember a year ago it worked for them? Why not? And on top of that, I think you did see some folks just get to where they realized, okay, maybe we are a bit overpriced. We started to hear the acreage discussion kick into gear, the rain in South America and and... Here we sit. So if I'm planning on planting more beans this year at my farm here in the mm -hmm. Midwest, should I use these price levels even after this break to make some sales or do I hold off and, and wait and see? If you haven't started selling, I wouldn't be afraid to sell. Um, if you were aggressive in the 10 to 1040 range on the November beans already, a lot of my customers were. Um, I have some guys that are half sold at that point because they figure if the bean market goes to 13 or 14, their average is 1150. You know, it, the worst things have happened. That pencils. Um, and so I had some guys that were very aggressive. I have others that were not. Um, at this point, you're still above $9 cash. If you are planning on increasing your acreage because of the penciling out of, of revenue based on where we're at, um, I cannot argue against getting something covered. Right. If the upper nines are, are making dollars, then make those dollars. Exactly. Now let's talk about this livestock market. We continue to see live cattle put mm -hmm. a little bit more on. Cash trade was reasonably yeah. hot for the week before a holiday. Yeah. Angie Setzer, are you fired up about the cattle market <laughs> coming into this holiday season? I'm always fired up about the cattle market because there's nothing better than a good steak. But I mean, when it comes down to it, we're seeing levels that we haven't seen since late summer. Um, you know, if you look back even four weeks ago, well, probably five weeks ago now, prior to the election, you know, if, if you would have asked someone if cattle was going to rally to, to late summer highs, they'd have laughed at you and told you you were crazy. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, of course, with the stock market strength that we've seen, that always helps. If, if you make good money on the, the stock market, you're going to buy yourself and your family a nice big steak. So, I mean, that's, that has something. The, the enthusiasm and the, the consumer side of things right now, as long as that stays in place, I think will help keep a floor underneath the, the cattle market. But it's important to keep in mind that you know, if you were, were really lamenting how awful things were for you even two months ago or, or three, and we're back into ranges that you can be making money, you've got to be doing something with it because overall we're still in a bearish commodity market setup. You know, it's, it is going to take time for inflation to introduce itself if it does. Mm -hmm. um, right now we're really trading higher on the idea of inflationary fears and we've seen decent export business. You know, we've, we've seen other things that would help yeah. give the market a, a kick in the right direction, but Overall, we're kind of front running this idea that with the Trump presidency, things are, are going to, you know, we're going to be back in the roaring 20s. Right. And uh, so feeder cattle, 
uh, yeah. just going to follow follow live cattle as this corn yeah. breaks. We might see a little bit more on the feeder side. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a decent supply of feeder cattle out there. Um, you know, we did see the the breeding stock increase. We know that there were more calves available. Yes. Um, but at the same time, with live cattle rallying, the feeder market's going to get hot again. Yep. Um, it has. Um, so it makes sense to, to be taking advantage of it, and, and uh, you know, it'll definitely be following along, I yeah. think. And, you know, we did get the cattle on feed report out yeah. earlier today. Total cattle on feed were down 1% mm -hmm. versus last year. Uh, pace, uh, placings and marketings up 15 oh, and 17%. Yeah. That going to spook the market come Monday? I, I don't know. It didn't really seem to, to care too much. I don't think it, it's really paying too much attention to it. I think with the weather that we've seen, that would probably credit, uh, you know, you, you want to push those calves into the yard with, with poor weather conditions sure. that we've seen. So I think the placements could be a little um, funky sure. in that regard. Um, marketings, of course, with cash prices the way they were, I'd, I'd be selling too, yeah. especially ahead of the holiday. Before Everyone, we let you go, Angie said Sir, yeah. lean hogs yeah. continue to, to run a little bit. Is there more strength in this? I would be nervous. I mean, our pork exports have been huge. Mexico demand has been huge. I mean, we've seen that happen. They have slowed down a bit here recently. Um, but, you know, it was, again, just like in cattle, it was only just a couple months ago that you right. were going to, you know, you were going to be paying someone to take your hogs. So now that we've seen this reasonable rally, I think a lot of it has come again from consumer sentiment, sure. excitement over inflation, things like that. I'd take advantage and, and be a seller. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Exactly. Angie Setzer, thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but Angie and I will keep the market conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, available on our website. Now, we've already started our year-end review with our M2M podcast, where the producers of this program discuss 2016. And next week on the broadcast, we'll do the same and take a look back at a year filled with earth, wind, and fire. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Happy holidays and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by... Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.